It's right at the top of the hour. Uh, welcome again. We'll go ahead and get started. My name is Alec Harris. I'm honored to serve as president of GIA Publications. Welcome to our Monday Music Education webinar series. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce you to Richard Floyd, who is the author of The Seven Deadly Sins of Making Music, which is a, his second book with us. And uh, Richard is really a legendary teacher in uh, in Texas and really known throughout the country. He's enjoyed a distinguished career at virtually every level of wind band performance. And he most recently retired from the University of Texas at Austin and now holds the title of the Texas State Director of Music Emeritus. And he also recently retired just this past June as musical director of, and conductor of the Austin Symphonic Band which is one of the premier adult concert bands in America, where he was uh, on, where he was in that role for 35 years. He's been teaching music and music education. We just talked about it for 59 years, and he's had an amazing career. And he maintains a very active schedule as a conductor, clinician, lecturer, and mentor. So just a, a couple of logistics before we get uh, going. We're going to try to reserve the last several minutes of this hour-long webinar for your questions. So if you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A panel. You'll see that down at the bottom. And we'll go ahead and, uh, and get to those towards the end of the webinar. And, uh, and then also, I did put in a coupon code for 15% uh, off of Richard's latest book, The Seven Deadly Sins. He also did another book for us, which was truly one of the best sellers in our catalog uh, called The Artistry of Teaching and Making Music, which is another really wonderful book and resource for all of you. So I'll put that information into the chat, use the Q&A, and with all of that, I will turn it over to Richard. Well, thank you, Alex. Um, and thank you for hosting this series throughout the summer. This is, I think, a wonderful resource for everyone. Uh, and I'm personally honored to have the opportunity to be a a part of it. I think I very certainly should quickly qualify that the condition of my face is not because of a fight with my wife, but rather we were actually on vacation. Uh, it was a Monday a week ago and uh, in Mexico and I fell. And this was part of the results of it. And first, I didn't know that I'd even be able to do this, but uh, it's healing. I'm going to be okay. Uh, and I'm thrilled and honored and happy to be here with you. Uh, I had taken a little bit of a different spin. Yes, the content of what I'm going to share with you is certainly uh, resourced from the book on Seven Deadly Sins, but I'm kind of putting it under a different uh, heading. I'm just calling it being correct. Don't make it right. Just because the ink on the page comes out the end of the instruments, that doesn't make it right. I might also uh, preface real quickly where the original title, Seven Deadly Sins of Making Music, came from. I was asked to do a clinic for the Texas Bandmasters Association. And I kept telling, I said, look, I've done plenty of clinics. Everybody's heard what I have to say. You have a lot of wonderful other people you need to bring on board and do these. But the guy would not turn loose. And finally I said, okay, I'll do it. And he immediately said, what's the title gonna be? And I thought, um, Seven Daily Sins and Making Music. He said, great, and he hung up. <laughs> and I looked out the window and thought, what in the heck did I just get myself into? I had no idea what I was saying. But over time, I came to the, uh, realization that our sins are not sins we commit. Our sins are sins of omission. The things that we fail to do or fail to focus. So I'll just leave that as that. Uh, the, the story about being correct, don't make it right. Uh, there was a gentleman in my past, I have been very blessed for being around wonderful human beings, uh, treasures. Uh, his name was Bill Stamps and he actually had been a superintendent of schools. And he worked kind of as a consultant for the University of Texas. And he was so good about being able to talk through things with you and give you some insights on things. And he, he said, let me tell you a story. And I've turned this story into a music context. Uh, band director is at Midwest. He's at the Hilton Hotel. 
and he's going to go to the convention center. So he calls a cab, the cab takes him over there and he's about to get out of the cab and says to the cabbie, okay, what I owe you? And the cabbie says, well, it's $16 and 35 cents. So the band director very carefully takes out his wallet and he pulls out a $10 bill and a $5 bill and a dollar bill and a quarter and a dime and gives it to the cabbie. And the cabbie counted it and looked back over at the passenger and said, and the passenger said, well, isn't that correct? And the cabbie looked back at him and said, well, it's correct, but that damn sure doesn't make it right. It's that value added, that extra going beyond that makes, that's where the magic is. The connection was not in the cab fare. The connection would have been in the tip, the gratuity for what happened. To look at it another way, uh, let's see, at this point, let me do a quick screen share. There we go, okay. Uh, this is a quote from Ruth Waterman. Uh, she's a concert violinist. And I'll let you scroll down through it. I'm certainly not going to read it all to you. But, uh, but down toward the uh, bottom, she says, it can, if we let the music play itself, if we just play the ink on the page, it can only mean that we are forfeiting a conscious choice of attributes, allowing habitual automatic ways of playing to overlay and strangle the voice of the composer. To me, that is a profound, a profound thought. And we can be really good occasionally at automatic ways. This is the way to play staccato. This is the way to count this rhythm. This is how much I want you to crescendo from a three to a five. We all have those shortcuts that we feel like are getting us to the music, but actually they're getting us the, to the correctness of the music, not the rightfulness of the music. Look what Pablo Casal said about that. The written notes is like a straitjacket, whereas music life, life itself is constant movement, continuous, it's spontaneity, underscored, free from any restriction. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but in reality, when you make a rule, when we need rules, I'm not knocking rules by any means, but if we make a rule, we also have created a restriction. We have said everything has to happen within this parameter. And uh, as, as, as a result, we have to be careful about leaving enough room to go with the artistry and the fluidness of the music. And that's kind of the, the point of the discussion. And now I'm not going to try to talk about seven sins tonight, but I'm going to talk about four really very fundamental areas of what we deal with every day, whether you're a seventh grade teacher, whether you're a high school band director, whether you're doing handbells, whatever you're doing, all of this applies. We're going to talk about generic articulation, a little bit about unconvincing dynamics, what I mean by that. Perceiving all rhythms literally. And I'm going to try to make a point that rhythms do not, because you, rip, you create precisely the metric measure that's on the page. You can do that and be wrong musically, artistically. And then find being obsessed with metro markings. So that's the four areas we're gonna talk about the difference between correct and being right. And yes, those are the first seven deadly sins in the book that Alec was mentioning. Now, uh, uh, and also you take those four categories and then you add in playing correct notes and tuning, you've pretty much hit all the objective elements of, of music. If you can do those four things with a good tone quality and right notes, some would say you knock the ball out of the out of the ballpark. Uh, I would argue you've just scratched the surface. Now there's a caveat that has to go into the play here, uh, in that most everything I've said has been said. This is Andre Gide, 
by the way, uh, this is out of a book by uh, Austin Kleon uh, called uh, Steal Like an Artist. It's a delightful little book if you've ever interested. But he says, everything that needs to be said has already been said. But since no one was listening, everything must be said again, again, and again. Nobody knows that better than teachers do it. <laughs> we repeat ourselves over and over and over because some student was simply not listening. So, let me see. That's a little bit later. We're going to talk a little bit about generic articulation here. Uh, Bruce Adolf says that music is never mere information. And at the same time, Pablo Casal says it's a wonderful thing that every note must have life. Now, I want you to think for a second about the fact that real in reality, we can only do two, we can only do three things. We can play louder or softer. We can play longer or shorter. And we can play heavier or lighter. Now, there is a million variations of that. And they apply to every note or they apply to every phrase or every composition. But all you can do is make it lighter or softer, longer or shorter, heavier or lighter in some artistic fashion. So if we start talking about articulation, in fact, gen generic articulation uh, is a constant curse, I think. What's the first word that comes to a student's mind when you say articulation? Or for that matter, what word comes to your mind when somebody says articulation? I would argue that nine times out of 10, <clears throat> the word is tonguing. We associate all things articulation with some point of view of tonguing. We approach articulation from a viewpoint of precision. Attack the notes together, release together, line them up together and create precision. And we're very cautious about how we approach that articulation because heaven forbid, we don't want to frack a note. We don't want to risk an insecure entrance. But I'm going to argue that it's it, articulation is not about the tongue. It's all about note shape. Now look, and we're gonna use these five, no, uh, there's more articulations for sure, but we're gonna use these five to talk about just a little bit and give some examples. And basically it's the front end of the note, the duration of the note, the resonance and weight of the note, and the role of air in the hierarchy of this articulation. All those things are important. This might be another, um, perhaps forgive me if it's a little bit too wordy. Articulation is the fundamental musical parameter that determines how a single note or series of notes might be sounded. It defines not only the beginning and the end of a note, but also the shape of the note and the art qualities of attack and decay. So in essence, what articulation is, is expressive musical diction. Articulation is our diction. And I think we can find words that guide us. Think about, if you're looking at how to shape a note, what is the length of the note? What is the weight of it, the style? The mood of the music you're playing, the context, what is the energy level of the music? Or the personality of the music? Or the musical period? Or the original? musical source. One brief example here, a staccato to me in an orchestral transcription is nothing like a staccato in a piece by John Mackey. That's totally, it's one little speck over a note. It doesn't mean remotely the same thing. Or what about composer? If you look at a piece of music and you pick it up and start studying it, what if the composer is Bach? What if it's Holst? What if it's Persichetti? Mackie, the Kelly. We could go on and on down this list, but every time I see the composer, that tells me a certain context that I want to start thinking about articulation. Or even what about the title of a piece? Are you going to think about articulation and air for band the same way you will in Butterfly's Ball? 
or satiric dances or sleep by Eric Whitaker. We're gonna reference that again a little bit later or Vesuvius. All those create a, a, a context for the style of articulation that makes significant impact on how we deal with it. So we're gonna kind of cruise through these. What about notes? Note, notes void of markings. They have, you look at the score and here's a whole section of music. There's no markings there. It's just notes and rhythms. Does that mean that there's no articulation? Absolutely not. What if the music is accompanied by an emotional term such as majestic, mournful, somber, festive? All those words are gonna tell me something totally different about the front end and the resonance and the length and decay of those notes. Uh, one of the most profound learning experiences I can remember in my career was doing a clinic with Frank Byrne, who for a long time was uh, uh, with the U.S. Marine Band and was a major authority, still is for that matter, on the uh, uh, music of John Philip Sousa. And Austin Symphonic Band did a clinic with him at a conference uh, on marches. And uh, we worked hard. I felt like we had them really ready to go. And he came in and he didn't deal with anything in our music except one thing, articulation. For example, in the trio of a march, and it was no markings. It was just notes and rhythms and slurs and accidentals and 16 measures and 16 measures and repeat. What he did using articulation to add variety to that was artistically life-changing for me. There's also the place near the end of uh, Angel's uh, Architecture by uh, Frank DeKelling. It's a 90 seconds long, three, two, white notation, no markings whatsoever. And you may say, well, I'm, I've got to spice it up. I've got to make sure that that rhythm is always clean and precise. It should just create an illusion. The word that comes to mind for me there is throbbing. Why after that 90 seconds, all of a sudden, an accent shows up? I want that accent to be startling. I want it to be the absolute antithesis of what we have hypnotized the audience into experiencing. So there's definitely ways that we can approach non-marked notes, non-articulated notes that create an artistic experience. And by the way, you will hear me use the word artistic often, often, often. That's one thing I think that us as music educators uh, need to think about more, that we are first, we are artist teachers. We are teachers of art and our resource, our avenue is band, orchestra, some kind of instrumental music. So what about tenuto? Tenuto in Italian means to hold. That's all, hold. Well, you can hold like this, you can hold like this, you can hold like this, you can hold like this. All of those are holding. So maybe it means to stress or lengthen the note. And if so, which is it? Lengthen, full value, stress, let's see. This is Shenandoah, uh, Frank DeKelly, the little three-part canon of the melody. And it is filled with sustenuto marks. And essentially, it just defines the canon, as I'm sure you're aware. But the bottom line is, there is no wiggle room to lengthen any of these notes. If you start lengthening those notes, this whole section just totally bogs down. So it's just a matter, I, sometimes I use the term firm handshake. Excuse my voice getting a little bit raspy. Uh, actually, if I wasn't doing this, I wouldn't have a neck brace on right now. <clears throat> and uh, so my vocal cords were a little bit sloppy. But I hope I, I make that point. Uh, here's another example. This is Lullaby to the Moon by Brown Bottle Majors. Again, Sostenuto in the melodic line and in some of the countenance up here. And you may say, well, what can we do here? Aha, look what's going on down here. There's a motor in the bells and the vibes. So in this particular case, we're gonna simply want to put just a little bit of weight on those notes. We do not want them to slow down. 
just a little bit of more love. By the way, that's a term I use a lot with students. Students, Dan, would you just love that note just a little bit more? And uh, it makes a difference. But now look at this, this is Shelter in the Sky, uh, John Mackey, and sure enough, here's some Tenuto Marks in here. But what other artistic and uh, liberties do we have right here? What does he say? A tempo, but very freely. So perhaps that suggests that we can stretch that note. Just give it a little bit of length, stretch it, elongate that measure just a little bit and the same thing here. So he's given us a little bit of artistic license that was not, not present in, perhaps in the other one. This is La Procession de Rocchio. And up to this point, th th this note, I'm, obviously there's more score going on here, but to me this bop, bop, bee, bump, bump, bah, that note can stretch because it's a foreshadow of an oboe solo that's coming in. So I wanna take some of the wind out of our sails and just let that note, that chord hang there just for a second. And sometimes that's what Tenuto does. It just suspends the harmonic content of that moment and gives it more beauty. And here's another one, a little bit later uh, in La Procession. I would argue in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sostenutos in a row, I would argue that no two of those are the same. As you crescendo and as you move into the triplets, you give more weight and more length to those notes. So that there's actually a sense, almost a sense of arrival when you finally get to the Andante con moto. Uh, to me, if you played every one of those notes exactly the same length with exactly the same weight, it would be a sin. It would be correct. It wouldn't be right. I found it interesting. I, I, I love Eric Whitaker's music and I looked at a lot of his transcriptions. I thought this was profound. And I reached out to him. Uh, and asked him, I said, you know, you don't ever, you don't hardly ever use a sustainable mark on your music. I've never seen any dashes in your music. This is what he said. Conductors don't make the musical. They just lean on the notes. So the overall phrase does not sound natural at all. It sounds like a machine reproducing the concept of a musical line. It is all brain and no heart. So to isolate the context of that articulation can easily be a sin. Now, what about staccato? In general, uh, in, in, in Italian, again, going back to Italian, it, 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 that's a detached note. It's not necessarily short, it's detached. And here's some words. I'm a big, I'm big believer in finding words that create personality. All of these words could, Describe some form of a staccato, light, crisp, buoyant, brittle, resonant, bubbly, effervescent, dry. Every one of those would be staccato and they would be totally, totally different. Let's look at some examples. Here's uh, Children's Mars, Percy Granger. And in this case, he didn't even put a staccato mark. He just says detached. Now, to me, what's going to define for me what is, how long is this note going to be? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to listen to that pizzicato string bass. A pizzicato string bass, plucked string bass, has something I call afterglow. It's that resonance of the note after you pluck it. To me, that defines perfectly the length of the note that we will experience there. And here's two composers, same composer, same piece, back to back, roughly five seconds apart, depending on how long you, uh, you wait between the two movements. This is in the movement three going to movement four. Staccato, staccato. Are those notes the same personality? Absolutely not. These last two notes are just a tip of the hat back to the second theme of the third movement. And it's light and it's bouncy, almost ethereal. And then the fourth movement, as you well know, the fourth movement is concert band on fire. 
I mean, it is driving and forceful. So to think that this staccato mark and this staccato mark would be approached the same way uh, would be a sin. So these are light and balance, balance, buoyant, they bounce, and these are bite. They are brittle. They are dry. Okay. They have to have some stuff in them. Here is the end of the second movement of the Dahl Symphonietta. You know what tells me about these notes? Look down here. The bells, the xylophone, the triangle, and the snare drum. They tell me everything I need to know about what staccato needs, means. And by the way, that is a great way pedagogues are going with students. Sometimes you can just say, Johnny, pick up a marimba mallet and play me uh, one staccato note on a concert F. And that marimba on, a con on any note is as a bah, has that little afterglow and say to the wind players, make your staccato sound like that. Well, what about accents? And this is my personal generalization and that in general, accented notes do not touch one another. They do not touch. Uh, notice here's words we might think about. Bat, ball, dig, dog, dot, jerk, pool, ta, t. Notice all those words are consonants. All consonants. Now, what would be some examples in this area? Here, and by the way, this is, this is Shenandoah. This is a typo. Uh, that was corrected in the book, but this is from an old slide that I had, and I didn't have the resources to correct that, but this is actually Shenandoah. But here's accents that offer uh, emphasis and impact to the, the line and where the music is going. Then the same composer and another piece, accents. These accents are nothing like what we just saw. These accents, this is jazz. D, D, ba, 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 di, ba. You did that in Shenandoah, it was slaughter it. But they both look the same. So we must look behind the notes. We must find the message in the notes that turns them from being correct to being right. Uh, here is an example in Prelude, Siciliano and Rondo. I think three or, three or more different accents in the same piece. These are very fanfare-like at the beginning. This one to me is much more of a stress. D. And then lo and behold, just a few seconds later, we have the transition into the cornet horn line that's coming up. And what do we have here? A descending roll of, of accented eighth notes. And I would argue to consider the fact that every one of these accents should be a little bit bigger than the front one in front of it. So it becomes kind of an evolution of accent. We morph into a much heavier style by the time we get to here. And these are more broad. Boom, boom, beam, very round and resonant notes. So within here, I would argue you could have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Those three would be the same. So within two measures, you've got multiple styles of accents if you want to get it right. Well, what about marcato? Uh, distinct, firm, forceful, hard, percussive, robust, but even violent. The word means marked, well marked. And in Italian, you know what the word marcato means? Hammered. So we have a permission to be pretty aggressive. And no, I did not include here any uh, uh, examples other than the feeling for words that all sent to me say well marked or hammered. Or perhaps it's an accented staccato with a sense of urgency. Well, what about unconvincing dynamics? The dynamics never sit. They were always in motion. That's what the legendary Robert Shaw said. Gunther Schuller said, dynamics are one of the composer's most basic tools with which to decorate the music, to create variety of expression, in short, to create real music. So let's look at some options here. First of all, this is a fact. Dynamics do not exist. They're unimportant. They're insignificant. They are meaningless until they are perceived by the listener. 
We must never forget that. Until the listener hears the dynamics, they are no value. We may make us, make us feel good, but we're not communicating any music. So we're gonna talk about two kinds of, uh, of uh, dynamics for just a few minutes here. First of all is dynamics that create contrast that we use to play louder or softer to create variety in this strata of dynamics that we're using. Look at this melody long, long ago. Everybody knows it. Kind of let it go through your head for a second. And think about how, how could you decorate that melody? How could you make that melody have more personality? And let's first of all think about making personality just by creating contrast. Maybe something like this. The first four measures, to state it nice and full, then two bars of piano, I mean, four bars of piano, excuse me, then start this one, piano, and then fortissimo, and then start this one back, piano, and then go back to fortissimo with no crescendos or no diminuendos, just pure dyna uh, uh, dynamic, terraced dynamics. Renaissance period was very good at this. Okay, but now what, what else could we do? What if we decided we wanted to create more variety in the subsets of the phrases? In this particular case, two measures full, one measure full, then the echo of that rhythmic motive, song. The two measures forte, and then again, two measures soft. Two measures loud, two measures soft, two measures loud, two measures soft. Now that's very simple, uh, no com complexity there whatsoever, but we have beautifully enhanced that melody by strictly adding dynamics. Now let's, there also, this one I can't stress enough, and I feel like that we all really in, need to embrace this thought that dynamics create line. They don't just create contrast. Well, they can just create contrast, but they must also create line. Let's look at this mentally. This is Eshoken Farewell. This is a beautiful, beautiful theme. It was written by Jay Unger, and it was used in the Ken Burns uh, documentary on the Civil War. And there's countless versions of this uh, on the internet that you can listen to. But look at this for a second. And I'm going to interject just a pragmatic thing at this point. I challenge you to develop the skill and a habit, if you don't already have it, that when you start looking at a piece of music, when you're hearing it in your head, hear dynamics as well as style and articulation and correctness. Go ahead and start developing that. Sometimes we don't stir in the, the, the ingredient of dynamics until other things are kind of in place. But begin with the idea of thinking about dynamics. When you pick up a score the first time and hear it in your head. Uh, you may be even sing this Pablo Casals. Yeah, I quote him a lot. He was a pretty, he's a pretty darn good musician. But he said that music is an endless succession of rainbows. So let's think for a second, okay, what, what kind of rainbows could we create in this? Look at this. All of a sudden, and when you create these kinds of crescendos and diminuendos, you have created musical line. And I would argue without those crescendos and diminuendos, you do have, you have no line whatsoever. You have notes. You have correct notes and correct rhythms. Nothing else. So the dynamics must be convincing. They must share a communication about the music. Here's another quick two thoughts on uh, dynamics. Um, the first one being, uh, this is amazing grace, uh, Frank DeKelly. You may wonder why I have so much Frank DeKelly in here. Uh, two reasons, the, the very first uh, alpha version I did of this, presentation we used all of frank's music and then bless his heart he went back and created these scores for me these are condensed scores that he put together 
so that I could use them for the book and also use them for a presentation like this today. So this is the end of Amazing Grace coming up to the peak point. It starts out here, Forte begins to build. The, the, the melody is in the internal voices. It's kind of hidden in the middle and it builds and it builds, then a multi retard and builds. And all of a sudden we get to the peak point of 91. Now I'm gonna flip to another slide and you're gonna see that page again. Now that page is over here because this is where the real important stuff is. Is if you look here, it builds, it broadens, and it's easy to think that the peak fortissimo is right here. But what happens on the end of the beat? We're not to the mountaintop. B2, we are not to the mountaintop. And by the way, I will tell you, this is a pet peeve with Frank, that, that bands do, do not stay committed to the dynamic scheme. I hear this piece often. And by the time we get to here, it's down to a my forte, mezzo forte. And then everybody's kind of waiting to get the diminuendo. But lo and behold, is this the peak? No, look at what happens in the trombones. These upward leaping triplets. Ah, now we've got it. Here's the big fortissimo, is it? No, look what happens in the French horn. He just keeps laying layer after layer. It's like fireworks on the 4th of July. They keep getting bigger and bigger. This upward leap of a seventh and it continues. Do you see any dominion, dominion window yet? It's not time for the band to quit. You see any here? No. The peak of this phrase and the most convincing dynamic statement you make is one, two, three, four, five measures long. And I might add this downbeat right here should be the same volume as this measure. You should have crossed the bar line with the same volume and then it starts a diminuendo. And that changes the whole architect architecture. Uh, all the creamy stuff he put in starts to actually come alive. Here's another one offers a, the opposite kind of a situation. This is Shenandoah. This is coming up to the very end and lo and behold, if you're not careful, when we get to here, our mezzo piano is mezzo metti. And then lo and behold, we have a piano. And then we play around with dynamics of a few bars and a forte piano, mezzo forte piano, another crescendo. And then it finally unwinds into nietti and the ending just on the E flat just disappears. But what happens? We play too soft here so that we can then have no convincing dynamics. So make sure that when you're looking at dynamics, you don't look this way, you look this way. Now, how would I solve this problem if I'm doing this piece? You know what the first thing I do once we're comfortable on it and we're starting to really rehearse it? I rehearse 75 to the end, those last four bars and make them as compelling as I possibly can with the maturity level of the students that I'm working with. If I'm working with a, a, a superpower high school band, I can ma manipulate that down pretty subtle. If I'm dealing with a middle school band, I'll have to be a little bit more careful. I'll have to stay within the range of what they can do. But the first thing I wanna find is, is what they can do here. Once I have done that, then I go back to here because what I determined here defines every dynamic in front of this. Dynamics are so subjective. So subjective. So find a place that creates a point of reference, that creates a context. And at that point, you can go back and create the proportion that we want to have. And I will say that playing soft is not a passive act. And I see so many bands, when you play piano, the posture goes, the intensity of the air goes, the breath support goes, and then it's hard to create intensity. Let's talk about the fallacy of perceiving all rhythms literally. And Bruno Walter said the measurability of musical rhythms and therefore the accurate, accurateness of its notation is only approximate. 
And there's several that we want to talk about. One is going to be distorting a rhythm, a written rhythm to highlight a musical style. Now, what do you think that could possibly be? Distorting a written rhythm to highlight a musical style or, or nuance. We do it every day. It's called swing. It's written in 4-4 and we do it in 12-8. Now, according to the ink on the page, we broke a rule. But the music begs for that. Uh, perhaps that um, I would want to, to start just a little bit in a the music of, of Gershwin. I might want to lay back a little on the flatted third. I might want to give a little bit of a lilt to the music. Now, according to the ink on the page, I've broken a rule, but the music has been perfect. A note or note grouping elongated to add nuance. Uh, and I guess one of my pet peeves about all these things we're talking about right now is uh, if you rehearse all the time with a metronome or if you rehearse too much of a metronome, you begin to vertically define where the notes change rather than musically where they change. So it, this might be just to uh, stretch a dominant seven chord to create a sense of anticipation or maybe a uh, deceptive cadence where there's no tempo change, the notes are metronomic. He might even say up here on the side of the page, quarter note equals 72. But I'll not worry near as much about quarter note equals 72 as I will about creating a harmonic moment of beauty on that note. Stretching the pulse of music before, during, or after a moment of emphasis, tension, or resolution. And I hear this so much. Uh, one of the examples I reference often is uh, Concord by Claire Grinman. Now that piece has been around a long time. I, if you don't know that piece, you ought to go look at it. Uh, it's grade three. It's not a hard piece. Uh, but it was commissioned by the US Marine Band for the Bicentennial. It was premiered, I think, in Boston. So roughly around 1976. So it's been around a long time, Claire Grundman. But the middle section of that is a piece called America by William Billings. It's not the America, my country, it is of the year that we think about, or America the Beautiful. This is another hymn totally. But Grundman beautifully scored that. So almost every other major, there's a 4-3 suspension. And that offers a wonderful moment to ebb and flow and stretch and ignore the rhythm and play with rubato. And you've got three choices. You can either emphasize the, 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 the approach to the suspension. You can emphasize the tension of the suspension itself, or you can just bathe in the relaxation of the resolution. Those are all right answers. There's no the right answer. And then there's a delayed or blurred release that exceeds rhythmic exactness. Now, what in the world does that mean? This is, a, to me, is a graphic example of, of, of this. This is Luke's A Room Quay by Eric Whitaker. I, I, I share this one with you because it was a personal experience with me. I've done this piece a number of times. Yes, I am very fond of it. I think it is eloquent music. Uh, and um, I have never been able to play major two, major four, major six, or major eight. I have never been able to play them rhythmically precise. A dot and a half note, quarter note rest, black and white. I can't do it. I always felt like that dot and a half note needed to kind of disappear into the rest of the fourth count. It needed to evaporate. And yeah, I, sometimes I would tell students, just smear the note into the silence. And I, it was just strictly my gut was saying that. And then one year, Eric uh, was at a convention where I was attending and I was at his session. And uh, he and uh, Gary Green, a longtime conductor at University of Miami, we were doing a clinic. And this was one of the pieces they were talking about. And lo and behold, you know what Eric said? 
He said, this piece was written, of course, first as a choral piece. And not only that, but he says it was written to be premiered in a cathedral that had an incredibly long reverb, huge long reverb. And he said, I wanted to somehow take advantage of that. So he said, the reason I created this with this dotted half note and then the rest was so that the reverb would continue to sound through that fourth count. And two bars later, it would do it again. And I will be very honest, I gave a big sigh of relief that maybe it was okay that I hadn't committed a sin in doing that. And indeed I had gone beyond the correctness to the rightness of the music. Now, occasionally we'll see a composer, they'll just put a little slur, a little tie into the rest that suggests that you smear it over there. Uh, Della Gioia does that occasionally. But it's okay to give that a little bit more length and the music, the slow music of uh, Brian, Brian Malmages, there's countless places that I do the same thing. I just tell it, I tell the players, just smear that note into the rest. We don't want it to stop. We want it to disappear. It's like blowing out a candle and letting the smoke go away. Now, if you make it correct, you won't be right. Sharp notes and dotted rhythms and in sick rhythms. Uh, Leopold Mozart said that dotted rhythms are poorly served by uh, he, he goes on to say at one point that, that he thinks that, uh, that, that notes, uh, sometimes that if you play dotted rhythms and six, eight rhythms, purely precise, they will sound lazy. They don't have life to them. Let's look at a couple of examples here. This is first movement, Lincoln Charposi. Tis on the Monday morning, all in the month of May. Just say that to yourself in perfect six, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Tis on the Monday morning, all in the month of May. You never hear it like that. Tis on the Monday morning, all in the month of May. You lengthen the big note and shorten and move the shorter, the, the, the little note over close to the next big note. Creates a totally different personality. And if you listen to any folk singers sing it, that's the way they're gonna sing it. They're gonna create, tis on the Monday morning, all in the month of May. And I'll guarantee you, I will guarantee you that those, uh, those, Folk singers are not thinking subdivide, subdivide, subdivide. They're just feeling and creating the words. An entrance slightly delayed adds drama, anticipation, or impact. Here again, we're, we're back to our friend Percy, Gret Percy Granger. That, uh, no, I mean, I mean, excuse me, uh, Frank D. Kelly. This is the middle section of Blue Shades the slow bluesy section, and it's been going along with wood, pretty much woodwinds and some trombones <coughs> coming up to this point right here. And when it just becomes a big jazz ensemble. But the only, the only emphasis he gives us, he just puts the word up here, dirty. Just a simple word. Remember earlier I talked about the fact it's okay to, to create words that, are, that have illusions for what it is that you want to have happen. So what happens here is the, the, the fact that if you stay straight in tempo, it misses the whole point of what happens here to my mind. And so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna break every rule in the book on the rhythm in this measure. It's yum, ba, de, ba, ba, dum, ba, dum, bum, 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 It's stripper music, people. And we need to capture that. And again, just to uh, maybe maybe give myself permission to sin. In this case, I asked Frank about this. This is what he said. He said, doing that doesn't just add nuance. It heightens expectations by making the listener wait for a moment longer. It heightens tension. 
when the goal is finally reached, the resolution is made even more satisfying because of that extra moment of waiting created. You can bring people on the edge of their chair when you go beyond getting it correct. Then one more in, example in that, and this, um, this is the sleep we mentioned earlier, uh, is this is the beautiful vocal setting. Uh, I mean, the, the band setting of the beautiful vocal version of, of Eric Whitaker's sleep. But this is something else. I always want to look at the text because look at the words here. The evening hangs beneath a silver thread. Look how diffused the beginning of those words are. Do you want those words to be pronounced rhythmically precise? Do you think Frank, I mean, I mean, Eric was thinking about rhythmic exactness when he did the transcription of this? I think. And the final one. Uh, being obsessed with tempo markings. A good tempo is a discovery. Believe it or not, the metronome does not always reveal the truth. I know that's blasphemy to some people, but I believe that profoundly. Let me give you a couple of quick examples. Uh, Keith Wilson, who was the band director at uh, Yale when Paul Hindemith was on faculty there. And I heard Keith do a lecture talking about his interactions with Hindemith. It said that Hindemith came into his office one day and said that he would like for him to put a group together that uh, Hindemith was writing a piece and he would love for Keith to, to do a reading of it. And Keith was both humbled and scared to death of what that might unfold. But he said, certainly, yeah, I'll do it. So Hindemith finally brought the parts to him. Oh, Keith said that he labored on though. He worked so hard with those players. He wanted it to be so perfect. Everything had to be exact. And he said on the day of the reading that the little auditorium on the Yale campus where they were going to read it, Hindemith came in. Hindemith was the back of the room. And he said they started the piece. He said they were not 24 measures into that piece. And Hindemith was yelling and running down the aisle. No, no, stop. It's all wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. And Keith turned around just totally broken. Said, oh, I, but then but they, it, we're doing everything right. He said, he said, no, the tempo. It's the tempo that's all wrong. And Keith said, no, I'm doing exactly the tempo that you put on the score. What did Hindemith say back to him? Don't play the tempo that is marked. Play the tempo that is right. Another one that to me is also equally profound, and I could go on with one story after another of this reality, but is when Bob Reynolds, uh, re retired now, twice retired, retired University of Michigan, then uh, USC, uh, when he was at Long Beach State, which was his first college position, um, Somehow or another, he finagled, he had Aaron Copeland come in for a residency at Long Beach State University. And they did several of the pieces that, that Copeland had created and in some cases had transcribed for, uh, for band. And uh, Bob had told me this story and I asked him to, I asked him if he would just write it. I wanted to say this exactly like Bob shared it me. He said, well, at the dress rehearsal, I turned to Copeland and I said, I know I am going at a slightly different tempo from the one you marked for this section. And I certainly will go at your tempo, but I really feel it at the slightly slower tempo. Copeland then said to me, if I were conducting it, I would go at the tempo I indicated but I want you to go at the tempo that feels right to you. That's a profound thought. Profound thought. 
I could go on and on. I did a piece of uh, Southwestern sketches, Samuel Adler, years and years ago, he was composer at uh, Eastman. And uh, he came to Baylor University when I was there. And, uh, he did. He, he was going to guest conduct a piece. And it was going great until we got down to the end of it. The last section of it was marked 120, cut time. Pretty high energy, exciting music. He got to that section and he took off and our players look like deer in headlights. And finally we had got to the end of it. And I said, Sam, that's not this. We, we were trying to do it at the tempo that you had marked. And uh, he said, oh, over, over time I've changed my mind. I like the much faster tempo. And you know, he was right. It was okay at 120, at 144, it was a ride at Six Flags. I mean, it was full, full of energy. I heard Macbeth, Francis Macbeth conducts um, one of his pieces on the little honor band. And uh, he got to a section and he took a totally different tempo than was marked in the music. And so afterwards, I asked him, I said, Francis, why did you do, you, you, that's not the tempo you put in music. He said, oh, I messed up. He said, I forgot to put a tempo marking there. Southern Music Company called me and asked me what tempo I wanted. And he said, I just hummed through a few bars of it and said, oh, I'll put it 128. And he said, then I realized that was a mistake. So he made a mistake. And that piece got played over and over and over, not because that a tempo that felt good to the musician, but a tempo that, the publisher had thrown into the part because Francis had given him a, a false tempo. So there's a lot more to it than the ink on the page. I love this quote. This is Bruce Adolf. Tempo is a liquid like water. It seeks its own level. A good tempo is a discovery. Now I could go on that tempo for two hours tonight. Variations on that. But we have to we have to feel good about that tempo, and we have to feel good about what the music is is speaking to us. And finally, I guess the the, the bottom line on this, and uh, and Alec, we're getting close to the closure on this. Is the this is the coda? I guess we might say this is a wonderful quote by Mallory Thompson at Northwestern. You play only what's on the page, and you will be wrong. Now I challenge you to make a copy of that, type it up, put it on your table where you study scores, put it on the edge of your stand where you make music and inspire students and teach students. Because it's when we go beyond that is when we get this experience, the artistry that we all love and enjoy. And then uh, for whatever it's worth, uh, this is the, the cover on the uh, book that uh, Alex team masterfully created uh, for, for me and for us, for GIA. And uh, if any of what I said tonight makes any sense or is of interest to you, this book is all of that and more uh, on steroids with a lot more uh, of the same kind of interaction with other composers and with other musicians and other conductors. Uh, that add uh, relevance to the things that are there. So Alec, give me a second. I'll uh, escape my screen share here and we'll field any questions that might have come up. So Wonderful, thank you. And so uh, thank you, Richard, really enlightening. So the seven deadly sins, just you did a few of them, but not all of them, just so I can go through them real quickly. We've got, uh, let's see, we've got uh, articulation, dynamics, rhythm, tempo, those are the ones you talked about today. And then there's line, silence, and proportion. So really an amazing book and very insightful, really helpful, lots of practical examples. So thank you for your work on that. I think it's a really a, a strong contribution to the profession. So thank you. And we've got one question from Paul Kyle. And it is, how do you address and develop the sound of a band? It feels like in the orchestral world, it's all about the sound of the ensemble and the band world we talk about everything but the sound of the group. Any thoughts on that band sound? Uh, I don't think uh, there is anything 
I don't think there is a band sound. I have not thought so for years. And I know I, I grew up hearing band sound, band sound. We got to get band sound. No. Uh, if, if you're playing Persichetti, you have to get a Persichetti sound. If you're playing a transcription of music of, Tos of, 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 of Shostakovich, then you have to get an orchestral sound of, that represents that. If you're doing a, a slow piece by uh, John Mackey, that's a sound. Uh, I think um, Brown Bell Mages, there's some beautiful sarnies, there's some beautiful sounds there. So I, I, I think that the, 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 what we want to do is the, 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 the composer has created a, I sometimes talk about the fact that I think that uh, uh, the, the score we see, the, the notes on the page, uh, that's not music, that's composer code. And somehow I think we have to crack that code and turn it into music. And yeah, we can we can tweak that because there's all kinds of colors and, and blends of sound. Uh, uh, Ron Nelson, uh, for example, talks about at times he says he does not want to hear a clarinet and an oboe. He doesn't want to be able to identify any of those things. He wants to hear a clear bow. He's come up with all these unique little names. And I think about that a lot. Okay, now, is this a saxophone and a French horn? Should I be able to hear either of those? Or do I want to hear some kind of a melded quality between them? Now, uh, it, I think it takes a while to, to acquire that uh, oral skill to be able to do that. But until you jump into the deep end of the pool, I, I feel like it's, it's difficult to do that. And yeah, some band, bands sound different. It depends on how much emphasis they want to put on the bass line as opposed to the upper line. But to me, that's all driven by the intent of the composer. It's not driven by, I want this sound right here. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richard. Thanks everyone for being here. I did put the coupon code in. Uh, Richard, uh, really, Wonderful webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we'll post this on YouTube and everyone have a good evening. Take care. Goodbye to all. Thank you for hanging with us.